So the last time we talked about, in fair amount of detail, about a shortcut to self-realization. And the very last verse that we read was verse 19 of chapter 18, which said, only through non-attachment can one attain liberation. So we'll continue from there. Let's go to the text, so that you can see it. And there it is, verse 19. That's the place we stopped at. We continue from there to verse 20. There is no other way of attaining liberation. To become the doer is self-destruction. If you identify yourself with your body, it will be like imagining horns on a rabbit. The self is perfect in all aspects, so there can be no liberation anywhere else. If liberation is synonymous with the self, then like a mirror and its reflection, it is identical with the self. Even ordinary people know that liberation is their essential nature. It is freedom from the bondage of ignorance. So we know that, as it says, even the average person knows this, intuitively we know this, that our true nature is Atman, center of consciousness. We all know that somewhere there is a foundation, something that's permanent, and that is what we are. If you begin to identify with the body and if you think this is what you are, it says that's destruction, that's the end. That's really limiting yourself to this level. And it also said that there's only one means to liberation and that is non-attachment. Non-attachment to what? Non-attachment to the external objects of the world. Here there are many, many objects your house, your car, your children, or you would say my, everything which has got a my in the beginning. My house, my car, my children, my spouse, my parents, my friends, my family, so on and so forth. When you add a my in the beginning, you begin to identify. So you also say my body. That's a form of identification and you get attached to it. And there are many other objects, like we talked about house and car, or my phone. When you lose the phone, then you get very, very shattered. Why? You don't get shattered when somebody else's mobile phone is lost. We get chatted when your mobile phone is lost. And then you say, yeah, 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 because it's expensive. Yes, but if somebody else loses an expensive mobile phone, it doesn't bother you. So what's the difference? The difference is it's yours and there's an attachment to it. So non-attachment is the key, but... Just a quick word of caution there. Non-attachment to objects of the world does not mean tiaga. You can do tiaga, actually give up the object itself. But what are you going to do? You give up your phone, you'll give up your house, you'll give up your family, you give up everything. Then what? You may still not find contentment, you may still not find happiness, because the mind will still crave for family, crave for a wonderful house, a nice car, and all the other comforts that the material world has to offer. So non-attachment is referring to internal non-attachment. That means you have to free yourself mentally, internally.
So there are two kinds of renunciation, external and internal. There's a renunciation that is called Tiaga, and there's a renunciation that's called Vairagya. And the difference is that Tiaga, in Tiaga, you actually give up the object itself. And in Vairagya, you don't need to give up the object because you are not attached to it. I don't have to give up, give up coffee, for example, because I don't drink coffee anyway. So I can claim that I'm internally, I have internally renounced coffee because there is no um, attachment at all there. So most of you could say you have, you don't have to say you have done tiaga uh, for, for alcohol, because if you don't drink alcohol, you can even say, hmm, I have done bhairagya because you don't get a craving for these things. So that's the difference. When you have to give up something physically, that's tiaga, and when you just give it up internally because you are untouched by that. It doesn't bother you, it doesn't disturb you, it you don't long for it, you don't crave for it. That's bhairagya. So we come to the nature of these objects. Now, since we've talked about the difference between Tiaga and Vairagya, internal and external renunciation, we talk about these objects then. So verses 23 to 27 says, to accept the nature of any object as both real and unreal is self-contradictory. Someone may declare that objects obtained in a dream are real and those obtained in the waking state are unreal. Listen further. That which does not exist permanently is unreal. The objects of the world are not everlasting. Therefore, they are unreal. That which causes bondage is not real. So, in this paragraph, we have a very good definition of what is real and what is unreal. It says very clearly here, the objects of the world are not everlasting and that which does not exist permanently is unreal. If you just think about it, your car which you have is also not going to last forever. The house you have built is also not going to last forever. You know already that the day you purchase your car, within a year or two, there are so many new cars in the market that your car is already old. Or especially with mobile phones, that's the case. Within a year or two, you have now, where are we at? Uh, iPhone X or, so, X or something like that. And all the people who have iPhone 6 or 7 or 8 or whatever it is, they are already thinking, oh, my iPhone is old. And maybe another 10 years from now, we will be laughing about these things because we'll say, oh, how funny they look. Now you look at those small little mobile phones that everybody used to have earlier, and they looked so cool then. And now they're already totally uncool and out of fashion. So none of these things is even going to exist in some years. They may be in a museum, perhaps. <laughs> but they're not going to be of any value anymore. So what appears right now to be very important and very valuable loses its importance. And in any case, those objects themselves are destroyed after some time. So many great civilizations have come and gone. Great empires have come and gone. So we know that none of these things last. And all that which is not permanent is unreal. 
Verse 28, to be constantly established in consciousness is moksha. Renouncing the objects, consciousness alone exists. So that's another great definition here. What is moksha? Moksha is to remain constantly established in consciousness. To be aware of the objects is to limit consciousness. When one is not aware of the objects, consciousness is seen in its perfection. So what objects are we talking about? When we're saying here that when you're aware of consciousness, then you're not aware of the objects. If you look at this diagram carefully, you will see that this is the center of consciousness. So the objects we're talking about is anything from here onwards. These are all objects here, all of these. So for center of consciousness, the mind itself is an object, conscious as well as unconscious. Both are objects. The breath is an object. The body itself is an object. It's all external. The senses and all these things in the world, they are all external. So when you are aware of the center of consciousness, everything else becomes an object. But when you get so attached, whether you are attached to actually the objects of the world or you're attached to your body or even to your thoughts, your emotions. For example, when you get very angry or you're very afraid. Fear, for example, is a very good um, way of uh, explaining this. When you see a deadly snake, a poisonous snake, your mind is only aware of the snake and nothing else. And you're possessed by the sphere. What happens? Are you aware of the center of consciousness? No, because you're totally caught into this external drama, the drama of the poisonous snake, the drama, the fear of losing your body, the drama of fear itself, which just takes over this emotion that completely takes over you. And this is the meaning here, that when you are established in the center of consciousness, everything appears to be an object. And when you are attached to objects, then you are not aware of consciousness itself. Is that example of the, the snake clear to you? Example that yeah helps us to understand the difference that awareness of these objects limits the consciousness. Verse 30, if someone says that consciousness is experienced only within the confines of time and space, then tell me whether time and space themselves are not also illuminated by consciousness. That which is not illuminated by the self-existent reality can never exist. If it exists, it will be self-existent reality. All the objects of the world are limited by time, but time and all the objects of the universe are within pure consciousness. That is why you can visualize them. How will you know that these objects which you consider to be unilluminated? Because consciousness is all-pervading and unqualified. It can be differentiated only if there is another self-illuminated consciousness. The existence of any object cannot be proved without consciousness because an object separated from consciousness does not exist. So, we are back to our diagram. 
and there to understand this. Can an object is, exist without consciousness? Well, it's an interesting thought. The objects are here in the world somewhere outside. We're experiencing them through our senses here. And consciousness is right at the other end here, to the extreme right. So how is it possible that objects of the world cannot exist without the center of consciousness? Any ideas? Aren't the two looking totally separate? Aren't the objects totally different and apart from the center of consciousness? Well, where do these objects exist? That is the question. Right now, this diagram, if you think of it as a white board, not a black board, but a white board. And you can see that there are different objects here in this world outside, and they all exist on this white board here. But what is this white board made up of? The body, what is the body made of? What is the breath? Where is the conscious, active and latent unconscious mind? Where is it all playing out? This entire white board is all consciousness. It's all consciousness. Yes, Perry, you're right. They can only exist in consciousness. The conventional wisdom, what a lot of people have been taught, is that this here at the extreme right, the center of consciousness, that is consciousness. And everything else is matter. So body is matter. Everything external is matter. And one thinks of these as two separate things. And this idea may be useful initially to help us understand that we are not just our body, but it also creates the wrong impression because the fact is that our body is also consciousness, only it's a more dense or gross form of consciousness. It's more solid. If you think of water having its three states of gas gaseous, liquid and solid as an ice. Similarly, you can think of this as the more solid, the mind as some in-between state, and this state of the center of consciousness is being very subtle, like a, like a gas. So we, we're going from gross to, to towards subtle, and all this is consciousness. It's just that we are so used to thinking of the body as matter and separate from the mind, which is again separate from the center of consciousness, that we forget that all of this plays out in consciousness. And the center of consciousness is simply a more uh, focused form of consciousness while everything else is also consciousness, right? Just the same way as ice is actually also water. And the water vapor, it may be in a gaseous form, but it's also water, right? It's all water. It's just that one is solid, one is liquid, and the other is gaseous. Similarly, the body, the mind, and the center of consciousness, they are all consciousness. Only they have different states. One is more solid and the other is subtler and subtle most. Any questions about this? Any thoughts on this? Any doubts?
um, ma uh, yeah my question is how to develop this uh, detachment yeah yeah rahu that's of course um, a very good and very practical question and it's not however uh, a simple answer <laughs> the answer is of course that we develop that non attachment through practice one is practice in the internal aspect as in true meditation which is something that one learns through guided practice as in guidance as in with the teacher and the other aspect is learning to integrate this in our life so all the objects that we have all the relationships that we have we learn to examine these a little bit more carefully contemplate on these and convince ourselves that these things are impermanent and learn to to slowly become more aware and that's a possible through one simple exercise called vichara vichara is also called atma vichara it's got different names in english one says self inquiry internal dialogue different words the same thing and the simplest way is basically to learn to sit in meditation at least twice a day in the morning as when one wakes up and at night before one sleeps and learns to have a little dialogue with oneself where you would begin the dialogue by developing a relationship with one's own mind and explain to the mind that the things of the world are all transient impermanent and listen listen to what your mind is saying to you also learn to listen it's a dialogue not a monologue so this is a process one can start off with you will find on my website on that first.com there are under essential practices there's a rubric called essential practices there are two or three articles on atma vichara also called internal dialogue and if you are interested further you can have a look at them and you can actually start just start practicing and it will develop with time and um, then let's see how it goes thanks radhika ji so all of us can start uh, doing this practice of vichara i didn't quite get get the question alan so with vichara can we all start doing it even at this early stage of our practice yes yes of course of course i always say that the practice of vichara is a bit like you know a to z it's the beginning as well as the end you know when you say oh uh, i've got this covered from a to z it means like from the beginning to the end and it's like this you start with it and it keeps developing it goes deeper and deeper it takes you through different layers until it really helps you in the sense it becomes your own inner guide you activate through this practice an inner guide within you and it you unfold this unfolds and um, that's really a wonderful experience to go through this however we should not assume that that's going to happen overnight that takes time for it to develop and in reality it's a complementary practice it's if you start with this but you need to additionally complement it with things like meditation like dhyana the practice which takes us from the external to the internal 
uh, meditation practice which actually takes us inwards gradually here from senses to body to mind as well as practice like mantra which is particularly useful in this part and prayer prayer is in fact a special form of atma vichara because we say prayer does not have to be ready made prayer but prayer is when you speak in your own words to the higher aspect of yourself so if you are identified here at this point either the level of the body or the level of the mind this aspect is praying to the inner aspect in you the divine in you and that is the center of consciousness so the complementary practices are prayer meditation and mantra these are complementary practices but for those of you who do not have guidance in all of them you can begin independently also with just atma vichara you can start also with uh, prayer just talk to yourself little children do it a lot very naturally and intuitively they learn to talk to themselves and they have little conversations very sweet conversations until some grown up or some other kid you know one of the elder siblings says you're talking to yourself you're a baby and then you know the child gets very embarrassed and that's it that's the end <laughs> that's the end of those sweet innocent conversations so internal dialogue brings us back to that child within us that innocence within us that wisdom within us and it unfolds it takes time to develop and if it does develop if you allow it to develop and if you even strengthen it with the complementary practices it can take you right to the end it's really a very very beautiful very important and very powerful practice it's often been dismissed by some people who perhaps haven't even tried it as simplistic some of them think it's childish some of them think oh i need something more challenging and the reality is that this is the original practice this is i always say the first practice the, the very most natural practice imagine that tens of thousands of years ago when man first learned to walk and, and looked up at the stars and saw a night sky full of these beautiful stars and he began to wonder he was in awe when he looked up and thought hmm what are these beautiful points of light what is this vast universe who am i and then that question comes naturally shattering through all the layers of the mind who am i and when that question comes spontaneously rises spontaneously and you then the longing to know yourself will keep increasing and will take you deeper inside until you do get to know yourself and everything else you recognize is un- impermanent and transient and then you rest in yourself yes so so i'm sorry if i went off there it's it's really a beautiful practice and i get sometimes a little bit um, eloquent when i start talking about it no that's very nice thank you very much yeah most welcome uh ragu to answer you the articles are there on the website please have a look it's that minus first dot com look under the rubric um, essential practices there are many of them and it's right pretty much in the beginning so you will find it it's called vichara
Seiten zum We were before I went off <laughs> into this um, speech about uh, Atma Vichara, I think on verse 34. The existence of any object cannot be proven without consciousness because an object separate from consciousness does not exist. Yes, that's where we had stopped. So we saw that everything is consciousness. It's the whiteboard that I talked about there. That if everything is consciousness, there can be no object that exists without consciousness. So if you look around you right now, I don't know where you are and what you're seeing, but you're probably in some sort of a room. Maybe there are some people in it, maybe not. Maybe it's your house or maybe you're outside somewhere. You look around, you'll see people, you'll see houses, maybe you see cars. All this is like that whiteboard we had. The whiteboard was two-dimensional. And this whiteboard around us, all around us, is three-dimensional. That space, that's time, it all exists in consciousness. So the whole world, the whole universe is all consciousness. So now another very important line in verse 35. It says, the center of consciousness and consciousness are virtually one and the same. They cannot be separated any more than a ray of light can be separated from its source. If they are separated, there will be no way of proving their existence. So we saw from the diagram that everything is consciousness. But as I mentioned that right at the extreme right hand side the center of consciousness is like a more you know a subtle version of pure consciousness and that is the center of consciousness but everything else is also consciousness so they are literally one and the same even though they may appear different think of the example of water and i said that water in the form of ice is a bit like the external objects. Water in the liquid state is a bit like the mind. And water in the gaseous state is a bit like the center of consciousness. To draw a parallel. And you know that it's all water. It just looks different. So the statement says that the center of consciousness and consciousness which is spread out it's diffuse and it's everywhere, are virtually one and the same. And they cannot be separated. Just like you cannot separate a ray of light from its source. You're probably sitting somewhere, the light source, whether it's a lamp, whether it's the sunlight, you cannot separate the two. They somehow go absolutely together. So, Raghu, I have just put the link of the website. I don't know if you have it, but there it is. And you can go to the rubric Essential Practices. I wanted to make a short announcement. Once again, I made it right in the beginning, but I want to make that uh, comment again, that this is the last meeting of the year. We will restart our meetings or continue from where we leave off on the 19th of January, 2019. And we always take this break around winter. We also generally take a short summer break. So this is now our winter break. And I also did mention that um, at some point of time, after we have completed the Tripura Rahasya, we will move to a new format, and that is live stream. Okay. Verse 36, 
Therefore, all external objects, even those which are not comprehended, are pervaded by consciousness. Thus, all illuminated conscious sorry, all illuminated objects should be realized in the ovum of consciousness. How can that which is one absolute be divided into pieces? O oh, Parshurama, think wisely. That object which seems to exist in consciousness is only a reflection, exactly like the reflection of the sun seen in a mirror. One object discovered by another is not seen. O oh, Parshurama, if we admit this, then there will be serious confusion. We have already discussed this. External objects create confusion. There's another wonderful line. External objects create confusion. Why are they creating confusion? They're creating confusion exactly because we are separating, we are separating these external objects here, including the body, from the center of consciousness and we think of these as completely separate things when they are not. They are all consciousness, in fact. It's like saying that ice is different from water vapor. It's not. It's water. Only the form is different. And if you argue and insist that they are different just because they look different, any person would say you're ignorant, right? I mean, even school kids know this, that ice is the same as water vapor. It's H2O. And if you would argue and say, no, 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 it's different, then they'd say, hey, you're a fool, you're ignorant. And yet imagine, it's exactly what we're doing all the time. We insist that these external objects are different from the center of consciousness. We are so completely blinded and that creates confusion. It's not the objects themselves in the external world that's causing the confusion. It's the fact that we think they exist is causing the confusion. We think that these forms are different from the center of consciousness, and that's what causes the confusion. So, when we come to the part, verse 40, then how can we prove the transitory nature of any object? Therefore, the self-illuminated Atman, with its own power of consciousness, exists everywhere. Nothing exists except one. So it comes to the conclusion that if everything is consciousness, then of course there is only one consciousness. During the sermon of Dattatreya, the sage Parshurama inquired, O oh Lord, whatever you have explained seems impossible. One absolute consciousness seen as many is impossible. Everyone thinks that consciousness and objects are two different elements. That objects are never found outside consciousness. Therefore, I agree that objects are seen with the help of consciousness. I also agree that consciousness is self illuminated, just as the seer is different from the seen. Likewise, consciousness seems to be different from its source. But consciousness and its source are one and the same. I cannot assimilate this knowledge. How can the law and lawgiver be one and the same? Ah, so now comes the question, the doubts that all seekers have. The point being now that though he, though in the example that I give you, I talk about ice, it's, it's very clear that ice and water vapor are one and the same. The form is different. And when we keep talking about external objects in the, the outer world here, outside the body and 
when we talk about center of consciousness here, which is so subtle, there seems to be such a huge difference in these ideas and the thought of it that it's very difficult for us to penetrate through this illusion. The illusion is so strong that Parshurama just does not get it. He doesn't get it because he's trying to understand this at an intellectual level. He also explains that he uses the example of lawgiver. This is a dualistic idea coming from a dualistic worldview where we think of God and everything else. And so he's thinking, how can God be the same as the subjects? How can the lawgiver be the same as the law? But if you think in that, you're thinking in duality. And that's, that's the big obstacle. But if you think of the example of water being ice or being gaseous, having different forms, then it's, diff it's easier perhaps to understand that everything in this world, the buildings that you see around you, the trees, the birds in the sky, the clouds, all the man-made objects like cars and, and people themselves, all these are a form of consciousness. Just as ice is also a form of water vapor. And when you understand that, at least at an intellectual level, maybe you're willing to accept it. But it's, it's no doubt hard to assimilate or integrate this knowledge. And that's where Parshurama is. He is struggling to assimilate this knowledge because he has not got direct experience. And that's why we see in our day-to-day -day lives that seekers always stumbling about this, these ideas because they do not practice. So they start reading books and these days they read websites and they listen to videos on YouTube, but they do not practice. And then the discussions are intellectual. They get into arguments and they talk about the different schools of, of thought and philosophy, and that is not very useful. Because finally, there is only one way you're going to figure it out, and that is through direct experience. So, what is the response to this? It's very difficult to assimilate this knowledge. What's the response? King Janaka said that if the mind is free from all conflicting thoughts, then the mind attains one-pointedness. This is the prime means of attaining the highest knowledge. That is the real nature of Atman. So, we said that non-attachment is one of the means and one-pointed mind is one of the means. And in a way, you can say it's more or less the same thing. It's not exactly the same thing, but more or less the same thing. A one-pointed mind is a mind where there are no conflicts. If your mind wants to move outwards into the external world, another part of the mind says, hey, that's not good. You need to go inward, practice meditation. Body wants to go outwards, go out, jump up, doesn't want to sit in meditation. That means there are conflicts in the mind. So you force your mind to sit in meditation. Because the mind is not convinced. The body is not ready, is not prepared. So there are conflicts in the mind. And these conflicts are causing the problem. The mind is not one-pointed. It is not able to focus on anything because it doesn't want to. It wants to run around in the external world. If Atman did not have the mind as its instrument, 
then how could it how could there be differentiation between animate and inanimate objects? The mind is cause of both bondage and liberation. The mind filled with desire causes bondage. Free from all desire, the mind becomes a means of liberation. Again, a very important line. This line, the mind is cause of both bondage and liberation, is actually very similar to the line from the Bhagavad Gita that says the mind is your best friend and your worst enemy. Uh, a very um, good line to remember because it's the only instrument you have. You have no other mind. <laughs> you only have one mind, you have one body, and these are your instruments. So rather than curse them, torture them, uh, you know, create more conflicts, we need to accept where we are, how we are, and work from there. Work to remove these conflicts. Work to prepare the body and the mind for liberation. Mind is filled with desires. We need to learn to deal with these desires, to free ourselves from desires. And when this happens, the mind flows naturally inwards. The body is then also prepared in a gentle way. How can the mind become Atman when the mind is only an instrument? Mind without desire is a means for liberation. Yet there seems to be duality in your philosophy. Usually, in daily life, when the mind becomes deluded, it is not considered to be truth. Delusion itself is not untrue. In such a case, how can there be absence of duality? That which is non-existent cannot function. But all the objects of the world seem to exist. And through them, the work of the world continues. So tell me, how can they be unreal? How can that be unreal which is a means of attaining the absolute? All cognition creates delusion. How can one distinguish what is delusion and what is not? Please tell me, Gurudev, why is everyone going through this delusion? I'm terribly perplexed. So, Parshurama is now <laughs> working himself into some sort of frenzy because he's getting really confused. And he says, in daily life, we need our mind, right? We need this mind. And you're saying that the mind is the cause of bondage. But how can, how can that happen? How can it also become the means of attaining the absolute? How can something which is transient, impermanent, become the means of attaining the absolute? Remember, we said that even the mind is an object, right? The body is an object, and all this is impermanent. So how can that, which is be impermanent, help us to attain or... Um, realize the, the, the permanent. How can the mind be used as an instrument? And that's a very good question. So now he's, please help me. Please guide me through this delusion. And so Dattatreya, teacher of teachers, says, that Tatreya, the knower of truth, was pleased with such a good question and began explaining. Oh, it's really a very good question. And he says, Parshurama, you have asked a wonderful question. We have already discussed this. But as long as one is not fully satisfied, one should continue contemplating. The disciple does not express his doubts in front of his Guru Dev. How can these doubts be removed? All individuals have different types. Of intellects. There are different methods of removing their doubts. Therefore, without asking questions in its own specific manner and with specific purpose, how can one overcome his doubts? Putting questions in front of the Guru Dev is a proper way of receiving knowledge from him. This is again a very important aspect of the student teacher relationship that. 
the student should feel comfortable to ask the teacher even if he thinks his questions are stupid. Because there's no real thing, there's no thing as a stupid question. Because each person asks from his level. There is only one aspect one should remember while asking questions, and that is our sincere questions. There are students who ask questions, even though they already know the answers, <laughs> sometimes, at least intellectually, and these are insincere questions. Questions to just show off or to, to, to show to others how smart you are. These are questions that are not sincere. These are egotistical ideas, ideas coming from Angara. So, genuine questions should be asked and the teacher should be able to, or is compassionate enough to answer these, even though the question or the doubts may appear perhaps to some as, as silly or foolish. But everyone asks from his own level and it's totally okay whatever one asks, as long as it is a genuine question. And that's also one of the reasons that I have always said, I welcome questions and very happy when you put forward questions. You can also use our Facebook group, that first yoga satsang, to put your genuine questions. Verse 60, the one absolute reality seems to be seen in many ways. This is possible in the way a mirror is one. But because, of in, because of numerous images, it is seen in many ways. In the dream state, the mind is the creator, the seer, and the seen. Similarly, pure consciousness alone assumes all forms. The seer, the process of seeing, and the object, seen. Even without light, a blind man can sense an object. Although he does not see its form, he experiences through touch. But in the absence of consciousness, nobody is able to experience anything. So we always say, therefore, that what is the light with which we can see all other lights? So we have lights you have a light source, perhaps a lamp or, or, or whatever. Um, you have moonlight, sunlight, starlight even. You have fire. These are all natural forms of light. But what is that light with which you can see these lights? And that is the light of pure consciousness. Without pure consciousness, we cannot see anything. Because there is nothing. We would not experience anything without that. So, without a mirror, no reflection can be seen. That is why it seems as though mirror and reflection are one and the same. Similarly, without consciousness, the mind cannot exist. Just as in a dream, dream objects and the mind become one. Similarly, the mind does not have a separate existence in waking state. Exactly like a dream, in the waking state, the mind seems to function in the world. This is shared imagination. So in a dream, you have dream objects and you have your own dream. You, you enjoy your own dream or you don't enjoy your own dream if it's not a nice dream. But the waking state is also a dream. It's a big dream, only it's a shared dream. Because if I meet you and we are having this discussion now here online, we are sharing it, it's a dream, but it's a shared dream. So you can write your comments in the chat or you can unmute yourself and ask something or say something and we all can hear that. So we're sharing this illusion here, this world illusion. It's kind of a dream, but only it's shared. 
In the way, in the dreaming state, cutting a tree with an axe is imagination. O Parshurama, if the activity in the dream is not true, how can the means of that dream be true? Human beings do not have horns. Therefore, to believe that one is being injured by the horns of a human is false. Get rid of false imagination, O Parshurama. In the dreaming state, the mind is the cause of false projection. During the dreaming state, the cause of the dream and the dream itself is the mind. Similarly, in the waking state, the mind does not exist apart from the objects it experiences. Pure consciousness, through its sovereignty, sometimes expresses itself as a seer, other times as a scene. At times, it remains in the state of samadhi. So what happens now is that you have two major states that are being discussed here, the waking and the dreaming state. In the waking state, you share this dream with everybody else. In the dream state, you have your own personal <laughs> illusion. And these are appear to be separate, but in fact, they are just kinds of dreams, diff just different kinds of dreams. And the pure consciousness sometimes is expressing itself as a seer, it's observing it, and sometimes it's expressing itself as seeing. And so sometimes it's really involved and attached to all this external stuff which is happening, whether it's the external world or these dream objects. And sometimes you may have noticed in your dream that you became aware just for a few seconds perhaps and then when you woke up you remembered your dream why did you remember you remember it because for those few moments you were aware and that is when you were the seer and you remembered when you woke up and so sometimes you get so involved in your dream, you don't remember it. You don't remember it because you were not the seer. You were lost in those objects. And then at some times you're in a state of samadhi. And that can happen when you are in deep sleep. Only you do not recollect it when you wake up. This seems to be a good place to stop. And it's verse 72. We will only get back to the Tripura Rasya on 19th of January when we restart our online meetings on the 19th of January 2019. So I wish you all a very nice weekend and a very happy new year. Um, I wish you all the most wonderful time, prosperous time. Hope that you can Fulfill your desires and be very happy. Thank you, everybody. I'm looking forward to seeing you in the new year. Ma, can I ask you, Rama Master? So, what do you suggest me to practice or start my journey in this path? <laughs> 